All right. Hey, hello, everyone. What's up? This is Arrow, and I'm giving you an early access Death Knight review because Blizzard, thankfully, released all 68 of the Death Knight cards. Uh, they released them early. So what I can do is I can go through. I can go through. No, not March of Lich King. I want Wild. I want all the cards. So all 68 of these cards have been released, so we can take a look at the entire Death Knight class and see how it plays, how it works, and everything about it. So, me personally, I'm really excited about the Death Knight class, and I'll tell you why. And the reason is Dual Class Arena and the Demon Hunter Hero Power. Okay, hear me out, hear me out. So, here's the thing. We have the current Dual Class Arena. Uh, I've not played, I've been doing reviews ever since the uh, patch hit to add the cards back in, so I don't know the kind of like the new meta what that is. But in the, the old meta, the one without removals, I really liked playing with the Demon Hunter Hero Power. And like even honestly when I played Arena before, I liked playing with the Demon Hunter Hero Power. Why is that? Well, that's because the De Demon Hunter Hero Power, it's one mana deal one damage. Uh, one mana use your face deal one damage. Which, obviously that's pretty strong. But, what that does, and it, uh, not ignoring the strength, what it does is it allows you to draft differently. It allows you to play differently. So, especially in dual class, even though you're missing out on class cards, even though half the cards you're playing are not going to be class cards, this was still incredibly powerful. And not just because of the hero power, but because it let you move down your curve. It let you shift down your curve a little bit. So, like, Hunt, uh, like warlocks, hunters, they are traditionally more aggressive classes because they have tools that uh, uh, they change the clock. The uh, hunter, they can, because the hunter hero power, the clock when they can kill you is a lot faster than the other classes. Warlocks, if they run out of cards, they have the hero power, they can tap and they can get more cards. So they're traditionally able to play faster decks than everyone else. So demon hunters can also do that, but they can do that while playing tempo. So what happens, and this is something that frequently happens to me, is I take four or five or even six one drops as a demon hunter. And the reason I do that is because I can play a one drop on one, then let's say I don't have a two drop. I can play a one drop on two and hero power and accomplish basically the same thing. Or if I take like eight or nine two drops and then I miss out on three, I can play a two drop on three and hero power and basically accomplish the same thing as playing a three drop. So this, so the Demon Hunter Hero Power basically allows me to draft differently and allows me to, uh, and it, uh, it makes the class unique from everyone else. It, part of it is uh, the strength of it. Part of it is the flexibility it offers in Temple. So I'm bringing up Demon Hunter because they were the only other new class that's been offered into the game. Now with Death Knights, they kind of go the opposite way. So Death Knights have two things, two key things. Number one, which I'll get into, is corpses. So, what is a corpse? A corpse, when a friendly minion dies, that is not a risen minion. So, like you see here. Like risen footmen, risen groom. These guys are they, these guys do not leave a corpse because they're risen from death. But pretty much every other card, like even undead cards, when they die, they leave a corpse. And what the corpse does is that it gives certain cards the ability to, it, it gives them like a tempo advantage. Think of it as a souped up infuse for, it's a souped up infuse that all the corpse cards share. So like here, Bongar Commander, Taunt, Battle Cry, raise up to six corpses as one, two risen footmen with Taunt. So you can kind of see here, you have six corpses and you can get six one twos with Taunt. So the corpse is basically about a one mana effect, like maybe 0.75 to one mana worth of an effect, right? So, and then we have other cards. Let me see if I can find. See, so I have some cards like that where you have the 8A taunt and the corpse is a bonus. And then you have cards like, if I cannot, I, where is it? It is an undead card. It is an undead card. It is like, it's Army of the, I know it's Army of the Dead. All right, okay. Let's see, Dead. Army of the Dead, thank you, right here. So this card does nothing on its own, but on contrast, the corpses, 2-2 two, two ghouls with uh, risen ghouls with rush, the corpse value here is a lot stronger because the card does nothing by itself, right? So that's basically what corpses do. So why does this matter? Well, 
when we uh, had infuse, like if we go back to all the other cards, let's say infuse here. There's like 26 infuse cards, but you can see most of them are split. Like you have a few here that are like uh, neutral cards. You don't really have that many. And so like uh, Insatiable Devourer, that's like not even in Arena. Uh, so legendary, legendary. So you got like the ones you see, Priest of the Deceased, Stoneborn Accuser, Merlocula. You like you get like four legendary ones, and then you get like one or two infused cards per class. So that was kind of like a minor synergy here. Okay, so let's compare corpse. Okay. Remember, these are all class cards. These are not. Uh, th these are class cards. So remember, there are 68 cards in the set, and 31 of them have a corpse. Now, you get some things like Soul Stealer here, or Soul Breaker over here, that these cards, when the corpse is on them, they, uh, they generate corpses. So not all these cards are corpse cards, but you have a lot of cards where you are spending, um, spending corpses to get an effect. Here, you spend corpses to get a, a buff. You spend corpses to get a buff. You spend corpses to get taunts. You spend corpses to get uh, to get runes. So this is an effect that is always going to be in play for demon hunters. Sorry, not de uh, not demon hunters. Death knights. I keep getting confused in my head. And from now on, this is going to be a key thing for them. So why does that matter? Well, let's take a look here. Let's go back to... The M key does not work on my keyboard, by the way. So, like, that's not Raider, it's Tidehunter. So you take here, like, a Murloc Tidehunter. So a Murloc Tidehunter, it's like a typical two-drop. So you can compare this to, like, a Puddle Stomper or a, a Croc or Raptor, anything like that. So you see, two, uh, you have a Tidehunter. It's two mana here, and you get a 2-1 and a 1-1. One, one. That's basically two mana's worth of value for a two-mana card. But... You have two bodies here. So because of that, you generate two corpses. You are generating, potentially, an extra, like, one and a half, the two mana worth of value off of these corpses. So that's pretty strong. Like, when you think about it, like, cards that are split like this become more powerful than normal cards. A card like a Grim Necromancer becomes, like, a really good card because you get three corpses. Here. As I said, the, yeah, here. Grim Necromancer becomes a really good card because you get a good body and you get uh, three bodies here. And these bodies, the skeletons, they all become corpses, right? And the skeletons probably need like their own undead tag, but anyways. So th this is one of the key ways where the Death Knight corpse mechanic will change how you draft. Because cards that provide multiple bodies become a lot more powerful especially when you need these cards to activate your corpses. Now, that's plus side. Now, the minus side of corpses is that, let's go back, let's go back to the Death Knight class. <clears throat> Death Knight, Death Knight. All right. So the minus side, let's take a look at Blood Tap here. Blood Tap, uh, two mana card, give all minions in your hand plus one, plus one, spend three corpses to give them one, one more. So let's ignore that this is a below average card, right? Let's ignore, like, ignore two mana for a plus one, plus one buff. Like in uh, Mean Streets of Gadgetan, you got that for one mana. So let's ignore that. You're not going to have three corpses on turn two. That's pretty much, that. that's not going to happen. Like here, Hematurge. It's a two mana card. Spend a corpse to discover a Blood Rune card. You're not, are unlikely to have a corpse on turn two to activate this, right? Uh, like, uh, let me see here. Other ones that uh, happen on hand. Like, two corpses to give your minions, like, it's possible, but it's not likely. Like, if you can't get one for two, then how likely is it going to be to get two for three? Uh, like here, let me see here. All right, this one, Tomb Guardians. Will you have four corpses on turn four to make this a perfectly good four drop you're not really going to have that right so the problem with the corpse cards 
is that they're okay on curve, but you're not going to have corpses on curve unless you get something like like something super special like a plagued grain, which is one of the this is worth the three. I'll I'll get into the runes later. So unless you got something like a plagued grain, or I think there's like a one three that gives you a corpse or something along those lines. Uh, I don't know where that is. So that's going to be the problem with this. Uh, that's like problem number one. Problem number two is that let's say you do have those two corpses. Okay. Let's say here you play a neophyte. You do have two corpses. You use it to give minions in your hand plus two plus two. Or give them minions in your hand plus two attack. So what happens after that? Turn four. You have Tomb Guardians. You don't have any corpses. So now you have to wait in order to generate corpses. You've spent those corpses on the 2-5, and now you have no corpses to use for this card. So you can see where there's going to be problems with, especially early to the mid game, in corpse management. And now I'm going to be completely honest here. I do not know fully how corpses work. In the sense that I know you get them when they die, but I don't know how spending them works. I do not know, like, could you choose to not use the corpses here in order to use the corpses on a different card? I'm not sure if you have to use the corpses, like when you play a corpse card. So you get this kind of like a, a push and pull situation here with these cards. So with these, uh, and it, the best way to describe it is that Death Knight is not going to be an early game class. It's probably not even a mid game class. It's more likely going to be a late game class because the idea is that you have your corpses and you use them to get extra value out of your cards and eventually you just overwhelm your opponent. So how is that going to work for them? Well, it kind of depends on which Death Knight class you use because the second key thing about Death Knights are runes. So the runes, there's three different runes there. There are blood runes, there are unholy runes, and there are frost runes. So each of these runes has kind of like a specialization. So for blood runes, the idea is that basically you use your health as a resource. So they got powerful weapons. They've got cards that use your health to do something. Like here, Death, Deathbringer Sorofane. This is like the, the linchpin uh, card in Constructed. It's a 5-mana, 3-5 taunt with death, which is mediocre, but death rattle. For a turn this to your hand, it costs health instead of mana. So that means as long as you have 5 health, you can keep on playing a 0-mana, 3-5 taunt over and over and over again. So yeah, it, absorb, it uses your health quite a bit. So what are you going to do? Lifesteal. So... Basically, you use cards, there are cards that use your health, and there are cards that heal you back up. And so there are a lot of cards like that. And that, so this is kind of like more of a late game attrition. Like as, uh, like as much as Sour Fang is a linchpin, like the way you win the game as a Death Knight is to play here, Alexandrus Morgan. Uh, Battlecry for the rest of the game, deal three damage to your opponent at the end of your turns. Now in Arena, not really that good, but if you can just last out, are, are your opponents really going to be able to heal that long? If you can last 10 turns after this, that's 30 damage. So you just basically play this, you play a bunch of removal, you play a bunch of stuff that disrupt combos, and eventually you're just going to wear your opponent down to the point where they die. So that's blood. So there's also frost and, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, there's also frost and unholy. So Unholy, their cards are generally about generating corpses or generating small bodies. So you see here, like Plague Rain, you get a bunch of corpses. You get the 2-2 two, two Undeads with that draw. They generate corpses by themselves. And then they want to use these. So how do they use these? They got things like a Stitch Giant. So cost less for each corpse you spend. They got things like, a, like I pointed out here, the Tomb Guardians. Although you have the upfront cost of four corpses to give you these guys reborn, you're going to end up having, like here, the menacing uh, zombie. What ends up happening with this is that you'll get these four corpses back because they're not risen cards. And so this is basically what 
and again split body here uh let me see here meat grinder uh unholy card generate corpses uh unholy frenzy send your minions into something uh have them be uh have them uh, resummon if they die so you get more corpses off of this and then uh let me see here uh nerubian swamp guard uh here Battle cry is some you get like three you get three copies of this which generates corpses. You get Possessifier, which generates basically five corpses out of one card. So they generate a ton of corpses and then they spend it on certain things. They spend it to give their cards reborn. Grave strength. They spend it to give basically a four mana bloodlust. Uh, their big card, let me see if I can find a legendary. Is it I think it was one of the first legendaries. Uh their legendary is a dragon, Lord Morgar here, or an undead, kind of like an undead, well, not a dragon. He looks like a dragon. So, raise all your corpses of 1-1 one, one Risen Ghouls of Rush. For each that can't fit, get plus 2, plus 2. So, Lord Morgar here is kind of like the finisher. Uh, you got cards like uh, Anti-Magic Shell, which was like one of the Arthas Death Knight cards. And give your means plus 1, uh, so it's basically a giant board buff. So, Unholy, their identity is basically uh, put a bunch of stuff on the board, buff it, uh, either buff it or it becomes corpses, and then eventually use your corpses and build up enough so that you can get a giant board full of a bunch of stuff that your opponent needs to have a complete board wipe for. And then, final, so, and then finally, we got Frost. Frost, obviously, their stuff is about freezing. Uh, but they're, they're probably, I would say, more removal-based as well. Like you see a uh, Thassarian here. He's got three deal two damage to a random enemies uh, based on him. You've got uh, one of the three star cards. Mirror Manipulator. Spend five corpses. Deal two damage to a random enemy for each. So basically it's a six mana Avenging Wrath that has a free 5-5 five five attached to it. A uh, better Avenging Wrath because it does 10 instead of 8. You got Might of Menethil. <clears throat> Spend your corpses. Uh, freeze the enemies. You got... Death Chiller, which is a new, which is a new and improved Flame Waker, Flame Wanker. Uh, after you cast a spell, deal one damage to two random enemies. So you got a bunch of cheap spells that you can spam, and you can use this to clear boards, remove things, things like that. They don't really have like, in my opinion, they're probably going to be the worst constructed class because I don't see Frost really having a good finisher. None of their like uh, legendaries, like, are really great. But what they have is super powerful cards super powerful cards and so in arena like you see here it's a firelands it's basically a non-rng firelands that also acts as a uh frost nova i mean that's absolutely insane it's an epic but it's absolutely insane so i'm hoping i'm hoping you guys understand like these uh and so the point i'm gonna get at and in my next, I'm going to go over a second video where I'm going to go over kind of like the nitty gritty details on opportunity cost is that the, the corpse mechanic and the rune mechanic really alters drafting for these cards. Now, I forgot to mention with the rune mechanic at first, because I just wanted to get the, what they are out of the way. But like here, if you take Lord Merogar here, so he has three unholy runes, right? So if you take a three unholy rune or a three blood rune or a three frost rune, then you are not able to take any other runes. So if you take a double unholy here, you lock yourself out of two or three rune blood, frost, and unholy cards, and you still allow uh, one rune unholy cards, or you allow one rune, uh, one blood rune or one frost rune cards. So you can create like various different types of decks here. So like let's say there's a lot of the uh, uh, let me see here find a good one mana frost spell like uh, that would go up here. Do, 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 do. Where's a good one mana? There are some uh, there are some really really good one mana frost uh, cards here that I cannot find at the moment for some reason. Okay here remorseless winner as an example. Remorseless winner deal four mana deal two damage to all enemies draw a card. It's Consecration, but you draw a card. I mean, that's absolutely insane. So what you can do is you can take a two Unholy Rune here, and then you can combine it with a 
single frost rune here. And those are your three runes, two unholy, one frost. And you can kind of create like your own little hybrid deck in there. Or if you get lucky early on, you can take a triple frost, you can take a triple rune card and get something really powerful that could just basically win the game. But the trade-off is you don't get any blood cards, you don't get any unholy cards. So you could draft like Death Knight five, six, seven, ten times in a row and come up with just completely different decks each time, naturally. And so, the, okay, and this is kind of where I am with Death Knight. As a, with Death Knight as a whole, I think there's, lo there's a lot of questions I have. I don't know fully how the corpses work. I don't know about the corpses. Like, there's some cards that say spend up to, uh, where's Army of the Dead here? It says raise up to five corpses. Like, I don't know if you can choose not to raise corpses. I don't know if, like, you can choose how many to raise, because it says raise up to. I don't know if you, like, if you have only, like, three board spaces on the board, and you raise three ghouls, does it take three corpses or five to use this card? Those are, there is a lot of stuff there I don't know. I'm going to go over in the next video about opportunity cost uh, because that has a lot to do with the drafting. Because I'm, as I said here, like if you take this, you lose out on the uh, frost rune cards that are like two or three frost rune cards. You lose out on the two or three uh, blood rune cards. So that's a lot of cards in the pool that are gone that you could draft. And I don't know how that affects offering odds. So I have theories, and I'm going to go over, and that's going to be kind of like a nerdy detail thing. And so that's why I'm going to do that as a separate video. But overall, because of the corpse mechanic, which kind of forces you into valuing split cards because of their value, because of the um, because of the rune cards, which uh, kind of force you into like a specific archetype, but you have kind of like that option which archetype you want to go into. I think drafting is going to be a lot more dynamic with Death Knight than with any other class. And I think like one of the key things, one of the many things that people have wanted is some sort of dynamic drafting. Some sort of drafting where like if you pick, like I'm going to go back. I was the guy who liked synergy picks. Like I like everybody else in the world hated them. And I was the one guy who liked them. And I feel that this right here is kind of a vindication for synergy picks. I am being 100% clear here. Because this is exactly what Synergy Picks should be. You go down, like you pick a card, it gives you kind of an archetype, and then you can build around that archetype, and it adjusts around that archetype. That's what Synergy Picks, if they had gotten iterated enough, that's what I think they could have been. That's what I think they would have evolved into. I feel like there was a lot of, like, I feel they were a good idea that was not implemented properly, but had a lot of potential. And I, I honestly did like the system. And Death Knights are a vindication of synergy picks. That's what they are. Okay, so if you do not think I'm crazy at this moment, I'll have more videos. Uh, my second video is going to be going over like a bunch of math stuff. And the math stuff is going to be mostly based on the concept of opportunity cost. So how does opportunity cost affect your draft? And how does opportunity cost affect which cards that you should pick? So if you really do not want to hear me go and try to be like, go um, really, really, really deep into math, like bad napkin math that doesn't make any sense, then you should ignore this. But if you do, watch that video. And then after that video, I will go over the entire um, class reviews. I'll, like, I'll go over Core, I'll go over the uh, Path of Arphis, and I'll go over the uh, ML M March to Lich King, the MLK set. All right, so I will see you guys in the next video on either the nerdy uh, number stuff, or I'll see you guys in the next video doing the card reviews. So. See you then.